I, from the baby boom generation, bring to you the Facebook generation a message of hope and prosperity. Now, you might be thinking, what are you, nuts? The world is falling around us, all apart. America is in the, uh, about to fall off the fiscal cliff. Europe is about to get broke. Africa is starving. Asia is under the corruption pile. Uh, global warming going all over the place. You might be thinking, what kind of a world you guys are leaving behind? So let me tell you a little bit about, just a clip about my generation, the baby boomer generation. Boomers took center stage from the very beginning, 78 million strong. They shaped the economy, politics, the culture. Twice as large as their parents' generation, they didn't just influence the market, they were the market. In a single year, 100 million hula hoops sold, 5,000 coonskin caps produced a day, and when they were old enough to drive, the creation of a fast food industry to meet their teenage appetites. The largest, richest generation in history. Boomers, now well into the middle age, control the White House and Congress. Let me show you another one of our apps. Three quarters of the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are baby boomers. So that was my generation. After the depression, we had a mindset change because in the depression, everybody was hungry, broke. And we had a mindset which said, we are going to work hard, we are going to innovate, and we are going to never be poor. And as a result of that, you see what happened with the baby boom generation. Now, when you work hard, which we did, we also kind of played hard, and we did. And we had the biggest party of all time. You probably heard of it. It's called the Woodstock. Now, you might think, OK, that's what got you into the mess that we are in right now. But the truth is, party is OK as long as you work hard. There needs to be a balance. But what happened was the mindset we had before this was that we were going to work hard. And like Shakespeare, I think, said, neither a borrower nor a lender be. And we had this notion that we are not going to borrow any money. We are going to work hard, pay our bills, and have a wonderful life. Well, in the 70s, some hoity-toity people from Harvard came along, and they had this brilliant notion called leveraging. It was just a fancy way of saying, borrowing money, right? And everybody had a credit card. And now we have the biggest uh, you know, multi-trillion dollar uh, debt going on. And it was that mindset that brought us to the prosperity and the mindset that got us to the position we are in. The point being that mindset is a powerful thing. Let me show you a little bit more. You know, a long time ago, you may remember or not, we had this mindset that the earth was flat. We lived under this confinement area whereby you didn't have much room to grow. Prosperity wasn't that good. And, you know, that myth went on for a long time. And you might be wondering, well, that's kind of stupid. Why couldn't somebody come up with and say, what's at the end of the world? Now imagine this. You're a kid in those times. You go to your dad and say, hey, dad, what's over there, other side of the thingamajig? And your dad, you say, end of the world? Okay, what happens? You go over there, dead. <laughs> so the kid said, well, dad, you know, when people die, we dig a hole, we put them in the ground. What's this, you know? Can you imagine you say, hmm, my dad, I'm thinking, well, this kid is clever, must have taken after his mom, you know? <clears throat> so how do I answer him? Well, well, oh, well, that's it. See, there's a well ground water, and there is a river that flows underneath that goes to the end of the world. So we take the dead people, go inside there, they go over there, dead. <laughs> so, and you can see how such a myth might carry on. But lucky for us, that's not what happened. Nobody told me that story, you know? We believe the Earth is round, I believe. And there was a fellow by the name of Columbus who didn't buy this either. And he had this notion, a different mindset, said maybe the Earth isn't flat, maybe it is round. So off he went from Spain. Now you might think, well, that was easy. 
Actually, if you think about it, that was really hard to change a mindset. It was really lucky that he was in Spain and on the Atlantic Ocean and decided to go that way. Imagine he was in Buffalo on Niagara River, right? And he said, you know what? Instead of going south, I'm going to go north toward Niagara. And all these people get into this boat. They go over the river going the wrong direction. And they go to Niagara over the cliffs. And can you imagine some guys over there, they fell off the ship before it went down, and they scrambled back and went to the king, and the king said, what happened? He said, well, we found the end of the earth. There it was, and nobody. And the myth would have continued. But that's not what happened. What really happened was, he was on the Atlantic, he went the other way, discovered India, and what happened? Innovations. Not just one innovation, lots and lots of innovations. And one of those side issues in that innovation was the discovery of a place called America. And which, as you know, from the baby boom generation, became one of the greatest nations on earth. The point being, we do lots of things, and innovations are great, but it is the change in the mindset that makes us do amazing things. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Now, mindset happens at different levels. This mindset that I talked to you about, that was at a global scale, right? But mindset we have at institutional level, at family level, cultural level. Some of these are intentional and some of those are not. So after the baby boom, I was one of the baby boom generation, and our mindset was, we're going to work hard. Me, I'm the guy. I go work. Mrs. stays home, take care of the kids, and we build a wonderful wife and life, and everybody lives happily ever after. And my mindset was, here are my kids. I'm going to educate them, give them my values, which had made me successful, and everybody's going to live happily after. Except that's not quite how it worked out. One of those days, when I was not working so hard, spending 16 hours a day at office, I was at home, I was talking to my wife, and I said, you know, the kids are growing up. Maybe it's time to have a chat with them about the birds and the bees. And then my wife goes, <clears throat> yes, yeah. Uh, I think it's a bit late for that. So what are you talking about, late for that? Did you already talk to them? She said, nah, I didn't have to talk to them. They're already way beyond the stuff. What are you talking about, I said. You know, I know these, and the kids are growing up, and there are boys in the house and all that. And, you know, they must be having boyfriend and all that. She said, well, yeah, see that, that kid? I said, oh, yeah, Ken. I know, he's a nice boy. Maybe he's the boyfriend. Oh, no, dear, she said. Peter, he's the boyfriend. Who is Ken? Well, he's the buddy. What do you mean, buddy? Buddy with benefits. Oh, my God! Let's go lock her up and all that. Of course we didn't. But what happened instead was, I wasn't going to do anything. I had a mindset change of my own. Until then, my mindset was that the kids, and probably lots of my generation, that the kids are our extension of us, and we're going to give them our values, and we're going to live our dreams and aspirations through them. What hit me at that moment was, you know what? These kids, this generation, they are an entity unto themselves. They have their own way of thinking, their own mindset, their own world, their own aspirations. It isn't fair for me to impose my values and aspirations on them. My job should be to help them achieve their inspirations. And so that's changed my mindset. Along those lines, another mindset occurred to me in the same time in my thinking. And I was, as somebody mentioned before, I was working on Wall Street for very many years. And this place, New York Exchange, by the way, we just got sold for $8 billion to somebody. Um, that's a place which created a lot of wealth for a lot of people. And I started thinking about it. And I said, you know, this is very successful. What's so great about it? And we had this mindset, and we still do in America particularly and all over the world, that competition is great. Competition makes you successful, right? And yes, 
competition is great, but when I looked at this, I didn't see competition. I saw collaboration. I saw people working together, some people investing money, some people doing work, some people creating factories, working towards prosperity. So what's wrong with this picture? And it occurred to me, what's wrong with this picture is while the collaboration is great, in this situation, the collaboration benefits a very few. A real collaboration ought to be where it benefits the most of the people who contribute to its collaboration. So I said to myself, how does that work in today's society? So I thought, well, I have a company. Can you imagine if I came to you and I say, hey guys, I have a company. I want you to come work for me. But I'm a nice guy, so I'm going to let you work wherever you want. You want to work one hour, one hour. You want to work seven hours, you work seven hours. You can work from home, you can work wherever you want. But I'm not going to pay you. But are you going to work for me? Then I said, not only am I not going to pay you, all the stuff that you need to do the work, you have to pay for it yourself too. And not only that, Every now and again, you might have to sacrifice something that you really like to do in order to do this work for me. Would you do that? No. Guess what? That's exactly what you and almost six million people do every day. It's called Facebook. Do you make any money? Who makes $10 billion? Right? So I thought to myself, I said, this is a great idea. Not that I'm against Mark Zuckerberg or anything like that. Facebook's a great big thing and, and you know. So I thought, what if I create something like this because I want to change the mindset and instead of having a benefit for a few, we will have benefit for everybody else. Surely everybody would come and work for me then, right? So I created this thing. Many years ago, spend all of my money and create this like Facebook type thing where you can do almost everything that you can do on Facebook, you can do over here. Guess what? Did anybody come work for me? Yeah. <laughs> so I said to myself, what, what, what's, what's wrong with this picture here? So I started thinking about it and I realized it's all about perception and values. It's about Transparency. The reason some of these things are successful is because it appears to you that you are getting benefits and value from it and therefore it entices you to do that. So transparency to me occurred to be the key and I thought to myself if I was going to change a mindset in the long run just like Columbus that would take us from this mess that we are in into prosperity for a long, long time. What might that be? And this gave me the answer. And I said, what is this? What is this? It's a shopping mall, right? With, at night, with nobody around and lights. Why do you suppose there are lights out there? Is it because people have too much money and they say, okay, let's spend some? No. The reason they have lights is because light creates transparency and transparency avoids crime. Nobody goes and does hanky-panky stuff when there is light. Now on the internet, unfortunately, we don't have lights that we can turn on. So what is the transparency on this world of internet? Before I show you that, let me tell you that if we can, or you can, me, I'm, I'm done. If you can, your generation, can find an innovation to do what I'm about to show you, you will perhaps solve some of the many, many problems that you face in the future. And more importantly, you'll probably have the opportunity to be the greatest nation on the face of this earth. To give you an example, what is possible? You understand this oil business? We live in a place where oil makes a lot, a lot of money, yes? Now, you might be thinking, oil, that's cool. Now, oil has been around for millions of years. How come only the nine last 
50 or 100 years has this oil boom occurred? The answer is right there. The key word is oil refineries. It was because when somebody came up with the innovation to refine oil in such a way that it was readily usable by people all over the place and you could sell it all over the place, it created an amazing boom. Yes, we call it the oil boom. People have cars, people are making lots and lots of money and all kinds of wonderful things are happening. So, what is the equivalent of that in our internet world? The answer is the information business. Now, the information business right now, everybody thinks, oh my God, this is fantastic. We can do this, we can do that, we can do all the things. Let me tell you, the information business right now is in its infancy. It's like it was oil business in the 40s and 50s. There are very, very few people who really know how to leverage the power of the information. Information refined is only available to a select few. What we get is crude information. It's crude. Can you imagine when you go into Google, what do you get? Search for Chinese restaurant. You get 2,379,000 hits. Oh yeah, right. Now from there you have to, that's not smart information. That's not refined information. That is information which is kind of just crude, you know? From there, take what you want. Why is that? Because the people who provide and create the information, they are the people who want the information to be beneficial to a few. The mindset is still competition. He who controls the information is going to be king. We want to change that. So how do you change that? The way you can change that is through innovation. That's what you need to do. Innovation for what? To create a system that will allow, just like the cars, that anybody can use this information however you want to. And that particular topic is too extensive to talk about today, but I'll just give you a glimpse. So imagine you created this magical thing, software which is universal, just one piece of software works on every machine no matter what. You can put it on a chip, you can do whatever it is, put it at home, put it in the office, put it in entertainment, wherever you go, the same thing. The information business is going to explode and it's going to make the oil business look like kindergarten. The real great part about that is oil. Everybody thinks, oh my God, we got lots of oil. Earth is big, there's billions of gallons underneath the thing. Sooner or later, it's going to run out. This baby here, the information, if you have created like this, this is the vision of the process information. Information here, unlike oil, is totally limitless. Why? The more people there are, the more information there is, the more information there, you know, that creates more information. So this is why I think your future is amazing. I wish I was young, because this is the time I would like to live in, because that's where the fun really is going to be. Provided you can take advantage of the circumstances and change the mindset to be what it needs to be. Now, this mindset is huge, big deal, may never even happen in my lifetime. But there is one mindset that you can change right away. They say, journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. So here is your first step. And this first step is so simple. You are taught it in kindergarten. You can go to the elementary school library and find it. One of these days, little blue engine. What's the mindset change? The mindset change is, I think I can, I think I can, and I jolly well will. And I hope you do. Thank you very much.